So we're back to the lungs, and we're going to talk about the lungs and T cells. And um, Louise Roundtree from Melbourne Uni, and the Doherty is going to tell us about it. Thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, so I was going to claim the left field talk, but I'm not sure I'm going to beat Phil. Um, when I'm going to talk about COVID, um, but I'm going to take an immunology perspective. So I'm an immunologist. I work for Catherine Kitsieska um, at the University of Melbourne, um, and I'm going to tell you our journey of T cells in COVID-19, um, and I'm going to convince you that T cells are really important in infection and vaccination. Right. Here we go. Uh, so our uh, lab group was traditionally an uh, influenza lab group um, in 2019, um, and we knew an awful lot about the immune response um, to influenza. So we knew that in situations of both vaccination and infection, we get things like TFH T cells, we get uh, antibody secreting B cells, we get memory B cells. Um, and then we also knew that in cases of infection, we get things like CD8 T cells, mate cells, gamma delta cells, and K cells, but none of those happen in situations of vaccination. So we were pretty well informed, and in our lab, we had a pretty good toolkit kind of ready to go to answer the question of, well, what about the immune system in situations of COVID-19? Um, so CD8 T cells are really important, I'm slightly biased, but in general, um, in response to infection or in response to stimulation, um, we get proliferation, cytokine production, cytotoxicity, and then really importantly, we get this establishment of long-term protective memory, um, where these cells can exist for months or years, um, and they can protect you against subsequent infections, particularly um, against variants or strains that change. Uh, so CD8 T cells, though, are a little bit particular. Um, they like their virus to be presented to them. Um, so unlike a B cell or an antibody, they don't recognise kind of the antigen or the virus in its kind of full protein form. Uh, what they rely on is the cell to process the vi virus down to kind of a peptide. Um, and then that pe peptide is presented by an MHC on the cell surface. Um, and it's that kind of peptide and MHC which forms an epitope that's recognised by the CD8 T cell. But HLAs are very varied, and so each individual can have up to two different HLA A's and two different HLA B's. And then these HLAs are expressed at very different frequencies in our global population. So there's some HLAs that are very, very rare um, or are isolated to just certain ethnicities. And then there's other HLAs that are very common. So one common HLA is the HLA A2. Um, and so in 2020, um, with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we started by looking for a peptide that was presented by the HLA A2 with the idea that it would give us kind of 40% global coverage to start looking at what a T cell response looks like in a setting of COVID-19. So we use a technique called a tetramer. Um, a tetrama is basically four epitopes. Um, so it's four kind of peptide MHC, um, all bound together, attached to a fluorochrome. Um, and we use a technique that's called tetrama associated magnetic enrichment, um, where we stick a magnetic bead to that tetrama, and then we run our PBMCs through a column. And when we're able to pull out the PBMCs or the T cells that are specific to an epitope and separate them from the rest of the T cells or the rest of the, um, the PBMCs. Um, and so by using this technique, um, ourselves as well as a few other groups around the world, um, in similar timing, identified um, an epitope restricted to the HLA A2 and that we could see in COVID-19 patients. Uh, so you can see from the little dots under the acute and the convalescent, we could see it while someone was actively sick with COVID-19, but we could also send, see it once they'd recovered into convalescence. And then we could also identify these T cells in pre-pandemic sa uh, samples, so samples that um, had never seen COVID-19. But we found that these T cells were a lot lower than we would find in something like flu or EBV. Uh, so you can see the red dots are the COVID-19 samples, and you can see um, they're higher in our COVID samples than our pre-pandemic, but they're lower than what we would observe for flu or for something like EBV. So we were, now we knew kind of one side of the equation. We knew about our epitope, we knew our peptide MHC, but we were interested in the TCR, so the T cell receptor. Uh, so we used a single cell um, DNA synthesis um, and nested PCR, um, and we get this idea of kind of inherent markers for understanding our virus-specific T cell by examining our TCR. Uh, so ourselves, as well as a few other groups, all looked into the kind of repertoire associated with this particular epitope. And really interestingly, we all found this kind of same bias towards a particular epitope. Um, so everyone observed this kind of TRAV12 bias. 
And then a group at Monash University actually then solved the crystal structure. And what they found, if you look at the pie chart in that red area, that's the binding of the TRAV12, that kind of bias section on the peptide MHC. So it makes sense that numerous groups are finding this kind of increase of this TRAV12 uh, in the kind of binding of why that particular rep, uh, TCR can bind to the epitope. So we kind of had this molecular understanding for why we're observing this kind of biological phenomenon. So the um, HLA-A2 uh, epitope that we observed, although we could find it, it was lower than we expected. So it was a lot lower than levels of flu-specific T cells that we would think we'd observe. So we went looking for kind of other HLA to see if we could find a more dominant or immunodominant epitope. Um, and a group um, had overseas had identified an epitope specific to the HLA B7. Um, and we found that we could get really good cytokine responses, so interferon gamma, TNF, and then we got really uh, high numbers of cells when we looked using our tetramer. Um, and really amazingly, a group at Oxford found that the presence of this CD8 T cell correlated with mild disease. So this was the very first time in COVID that someone had found a CD8 T cell correlated with protection. So we observed these CD8 T cells specific to this B7 epitope, and we found that we could identify them like early in infection, but also we could identify them out to nine months post-infection, showing this idea of that kind of long-term immune memory. So we had a look again at that kind of convalescence of people recovering from COVID-19, and we compared them to pre-pandemic samples. And again, we could find the presence of these T cells. But then when we looked at the kind of um, phenotypic state of the T cell, we found that in the COVID-19 patients, the cells have what we call a memory phenotype, meaning they were antigen experience. They'd seen and responded to the antigen before. In comparison, the pre-pandemic samples had a naive phenotype, meaning they'd never seen the epitope before. Um, and we believe, therefore, that the high levels that we're observing of these T cells is not because they've already responded to a similar infection. So we had a look, and you can see this levels of response here. So the dark blue is our B7 T cells um, in our uh, COVID-19 patients. And you can see the levels there are higher than the red ones, which are the A2 T cells. And both of those responses are higher than what we see in the pre-pandemic samples. But the blue pre-pandemic samples are higher than the pink A2. So again, we have that this uh, B7 T cell is at a higher level than the A2 T cells that we observed kind of earlier in 2020. So we then again wanted to look at our T cell, um, our repertoire to understand if we could link the level of T cell to its um, immune mechanisms. And what we found was unlike the A2, where we saw a lot of one receptor, in our B7 response, we're seeing a lot of different types of receptors. And so we believe that this means that our immunodominant um, B7 uh, T cell um, has a high precursor frequency, um, and it's because the receptor that recognises it is really diverse. So we have high numbers because they're easy to make, and a lot of different receptors can recognise it, as opposed to our A2, which was subdominant, which needs a more specific receptor. So if we now have two examples of kind of an immunodominant and a subdominant uh, T cell, what about if we kind of combine some of this knowledge and have a look in a vulnerable population? So we looked at T cell responses in children. Uh, we recruited, uh, along with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, um, St. Jude's Hospital in uh, Memphis um, and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, um, a cohort of 57 children. Um, and about half of them, we had their kind of paired mother. So it was a child and mother that we could examine. Um, most of our recipients, um, were PCR positive, about half had symptoms, and really importantly, we had a really nice coverage of HLAs where we knew the particular epitope that T cells could recognise specific to COVID-19. So all but three of the donors that we recruited, we had a T cell epitope that we knew about that we could study. So the first step, as always in COVID research, was to have a look um, at, at who was PCR positive and who had antibody responses. So most of the donors in our cohort, these uh, were all infected around the ancestral strain in 2020. Uh, so most were PCR positive and had antibody responses, which is what you would expect. We had a small group in that second line that were PCR negative, um, but they had antibodies. So most likely we just missed the infection. When we uh, did the sample, we just missed that PCR positivity. Uh, but they were a known close contact and it wasn't a surprise that they would have been infected and generated antibodies. In the third line, we have a little bit more of an unusual group. These are PCR positive, but they didn't generate any antibodies. And we believe that these kids never really produced an immune response specific to COVID-19. And then finally, in that bottom level, we have the PCR negative and the antibody negative, who were close contacts, but were never infected. 
So we looked across seven different uh, HLA epitope, uh, sorry, epitopes. Um, so we had the A2 and the B7, which I introduced, but we introduced another five uh, CD8 epitopes and one CD4 epitopes, which gave us better population coverage to look at what's happening at CD8 T cells in general, recognising SARS-CoV-2, rather than just two examples. When we pool all those epitopes together, what we found was in general, our seropositive children, so people that produced an antibody response, they had lower levels of T cells than their mothers did or than parents did. Um, and then we dug down a little bit deeper and we found that it was actually a difference in the ORF and N-specific epitopes rather than the spike-specific epitopes that was lower in the children compared to the adults. We found in our groups that never seroconverted, so never had any antibodies, we found very similar levels of T cells. We went the step further to look, okay, what's the phenotype then? Are these T cells that we're seeing in children and in adults, are they the result of antigen exposure? So are they central memory where they've seen an antigen or are they naive? And what we found was in the seropositive groups, the majority of the cells were central memory, which you can see in the like limey green. Um, or in the case of children, they were stem cell memory, which are still memory, but there's a little bit more flexibility to that cell type. In comparison, our seronegative children and adults were predominantly naive, meaning they weren't experiencing, they hadn't seen and responded to an antigen. And then finally, again, we looked at our T cell receptor. So is there a mechanistic underneath this of why there's difference in, in adults and children? And what we found was that although we could see biases in the children and the adults, so particular sequences that were coming up often in the receptor, what we found was that the adults had expansion, so single clones that had proliferated in response to antigen. So they're the kind of big circles in the bottom row. And as you can see in the top row, there's no big circles. There's no clonal expansion in the children. So we believe if you add that together, we have this lack of clonal expansion might explain why we have lower levels of our ORF and N-specific CD8 T cells in our children compared to adults. But the good news is there were beautiful CD8 T cells and CD4 T cell responses in children, meaning that when they are infected with SARS-CoV-2, they are generating a prototypic immune response, and that we believe will give them lasting protection towards a subsequent, um, subsequent SARS-CoV-2 infection. My final story I want to tell you about is what about COVID-19 vaccinations. So we took a similar approach of we have this nice um, cohort of, of epitopes that we can look at and we've applied it to a vaccine cohort. Um, so we looked at adults um, with uh, haematology uh, or mal varying malignancies and treatments um, and we recruited these patients uh, with Brenda Mate at Peter Mac. Um, so most of our patients um, were um, vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine um, based off their age, um, but we have a few that had the Pfizer vaccine, um, and then most of our patients in this cohort uh, received a third dose, um, which was mRNA for the vast majority of our patients. So again, starting with antibodies, we found that our healthy individuals um, by the second dose of vaccine, 100% of them were seropositive for antibodies, but in comparison, the haematology patients only had about 64% um, were seropositive. This is not surprising, so the, the malignancies tend to affect B cells, so it's not surprising to have lower levels of antibodies in these cohorts. Uh, in the healthy cohort, by the third dose, so that booster, and three months after booster, we still had 100% seroprotection. Um, but again, the haematology patients, only 85% of the patients had significant levels of antibodies. Uh, we then looked at uh, neutralising. We did this um, in collaboration with Cantor's group. And we, again, found higher levels of neutralising antibodies in the healthy patients compared to the uh, haematology patients. And we have found higher levels of neutralising antibodies towards uh, the original uh, Wuhan ancestry stain compared to the Omicron strain. So again, we used our tetramers to pull out our epitope-specific T cells. Um, so we looked at, again, one CD4 epitope. Um, and it is a spike restricted epitope, or it comes from the spike protein. Um, and then we looked at, you can see there is the example of again that A2 spike epitope. And then we also looked at another six uh, CD8 T cell epitopes. Um, and in case they were all coming from the spike protein, um, as that's what the vaccine comes with. And we studied our healthy cohort versus our uh, different disease cohorts from our uh, haematology patients. And we found that no matter what the disease, uh, bar the WM naive, where we had low patient numbers, all of them saw a significant increase in the number of CD8 T cells um, that were specific to SARS-CoV-2 epitopes following vaccination. And this was following the second dose or the third dose um, of vaccine. 
Um, and we found, therefore, we believe these uh, cells to be protective. So the lack of B cells or the lack of antibodies didn't impact on a patient's ability to produce CD8 T cells. Whoops, I've gone one too far. Anyway. Um, and so again, we looked at our TCRs um, and we just kept it really simple here. We wanted to know if the TCRs being produced by our haematology vaccinated patients were the same or different than that being produced by a healthy patient, either following infection or vaccination. And you can just see here by the kind of clustering of those different colours together, we are getting very similar TCRs. There's nothing inherently different about the TCR that's being generated by a haematology vaccination patient than there is by a healthy individual in case of vaccination or inf uh, infection. Um, so in general, there's nothing special about the TCRs in our, in our patient cohort. So I started by telling you we knew a lot about flu, and now three years later, we know a fair bit about COVID. Uh, so we know that we kind of get the antibody secreting cells, we know we get the memory B cells, um, in both vaccination and infection. And then unlike flu, we know we get beautiful CD4 and CD8 T cell responses following both infection and vaccination. And we know that these cells can last, at this point we've looked out to about two years, um, but we know that they can last and that they can cause cross-strain protection. Our final question with this cohort was then, well, what about a breakthrough infection? So our cohort were all vaccinated before they were infected. And then we had a subset of our patients in our follow-up time period that were then infected with COVID-19. And what we found when we looked at the antibody responses was that a patient and healthy who had been um, infected with COVID-19, their antibody responses were higher than our patients that had just been vaccinated. But what was really interesting was that the T cell responses looked the same. So getting COVID-19 following vaccination didn't cause a boost or an increase in their CD4 or CD8 T cells specific to the SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. Um, and so we believe that the the CD8 and the CD4 T cells produced uh, following vaccination are sufficient to cause protection against severe, influence, uh, severe COVID. So in summary, I've told you about the kind of immunodominant uh, B7 epitope that we've identified and studied into long-term memory. Um, we found that there was establishment of epitope-specific memory T cell populations in SARS-CoV-2 infected children who seroconvert. And then we found that both SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination induced epitope-specific uh, T and B cell responses. Um, our next question, though, is, well, what about the longevity of these responses in the haematology patient? So we've looked at about three months uh, following the third dose, um, but we don't know what those responses look kind of 12 months down the track. Um, it just remains for me to thank everybody involved. Uh, the majority of the lab work happened in Catherine Kazieska's lab. Um, uh, Dr. Juan Nguyen and Lily Allen and myself uh, kind of ran these projects. Um, but, but we collaborate with a lot of universities and institutes around the world. Um, and a big thank you, uh, many of you in the room, um, we've also gotten samples from. So a big thank you to the hospitals and the clinicians involved um, in sample recruitment. We couldn't do any of this work uh, without those precious um, samples. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thanks for a great talk. Louise, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Have you mapped the T cell epitopes over the evolution of the virus? We haven't mapped them per se, and there are definitely groups that have. We have followed the ones that we're interested in. So um, we've got about kind of 20 epitopes that cover those kind of high frequent HLA. Um, and, and basically they haven't changed. They're still conserved. The only exception to that rule is A68, the epitope um, has changed with Omicron. Um, so that's kind of the only one that I know of that, that's coming out of the kind of immunodominant high frequency HLAs where there's been a change because of the strain. So that's what leads to my confusion. So if these epitopes that you're mapping haven't changed, but we are still susceptible to getting reinfected and, we have in, and you've been induced with these T cell populations, how do you resolve that? So T cells won't stop you getting infected, is the short answer, unfortunately. Uh, so T cells will stop severe infection, they'll, they'll decrease hospitalisation, so they'll limit infect, uh, like infection, but they don't stop transmission and they don't stop you with that initial phase of infection. So it's your antibody response that stops infection and it's your T cells that sort of stop severe infection and they help with disease resolution. Was there another, uh, there's another question on this tape. Thanks, Louise, that was a lovely talk. Um, so you were saying that the CD4 cells weren't boosted when you got an infection after you'd had vaccination, is that right? 
Yep, so the ones we studied, the, C, the CD8 and the CD4, weren't boosted after infection. Which has also been seen when you get a subsequent vaccination that you don't always boost up your responses. So have you any thoughts or insights into why that might be? I think you're just probably hitting a cap. There's only so many CD4, CD8 T cells that are, are helpful to have. Um, and I think both in the subsequent vaccine. So we found some of our patient um, hit that kind of their top level of CD4 or CD8 T cells after the second dose. Others got there after the third dose. So there is going to be a bit of kind of depends on who you are on what that looks like. Um, and I imagine it's just because biologically there's, there gets to a point where it's not helpful to have more. Um, and so there will be an interesting one to have a look at if you look in, in 12 months time, have the levels dropped back and so reboosting or infection, does that put you back at a level where you were? So I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see like a, a bit of a decrease over time and that boosting can be important to put you kind of back at a higher level. But we found when we looked uh, pre-vaccination just in infected patients, when we looked at nine months following infection, the levels were really similar to what we saw kind of three weeks after infection. So there's pretty good longevity in those cells. Thanks, that, that was really good. Um, and, and we clearly don't pay enough attention to T cells. Uh, so can I ask you, th th this thing about the, the T cells providing protection against, sorry, disease, um, more than infection, and, and indeed that cross-protection we've seen with COVID is, is broader? Yep. Is that, is that a sort of universal feature of responses to infections? So we like to see that. I, I mean, there's some of that with the flaviviruses. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and presumably with flu and others. So I can speak okay. to flu. So this same idea that the, the epitopes for uh, T cells are conserved in flu more so than the antibody epitopes. Yeah. And that's mainly because the, the antibody epitopes are on the kind of surface of the virus. They're in HA, whereas your T cells can recognise epitopes from a lot of different viruses, but a lot of them tend to be internal and they tend to be conserved. So we may be sort of giving uh, either natural responses or vaccine responses underestimating their effectiveness if we're not measuring T-cell responses as well. Yeah. The second one is this HLA, the influence of the HLA, and because we have quite a heterogeneous population, it, how much of this then is generalizable across our population? How much does that difference in their HLA markers likely to affect either na in the, how well they respond to a, how they respond to a natural infection or to a vaccine? Yeah. So in General HLAs aren't associated with kind of better or worse outcomes. There's a few examples. So in the situation of flu, the HLA A24 is associated with severe infection, but that's probably one of the, the rare examples where we know that one particular HLA just doesn't have good epitopes for flu. Um, although that said, we, we know there are epitopes out there and we, and we know they work, so we don't quite understand the link to why that HLA does have kind of increased severity. Um, and then the flip side probably is in this kind of B7 one for COVID. Again, that's one of the rare ones where we know that having that epitope can help you respond. Um, in general, all epitopes can present something. Um, and so something is presented, something is recognised. And we tend to look at and know about and measure the ones that are common, so high frequency. Um, and we do a bit of work that's looking at high frequency in Australia and high frequency globally. Um, our flu program is a lot further developed, obviously, than our COVID program in this. So we have a program where we are looking particularly at First Nations peoples um, because HLA um, expressed at a high frequency in a First Nation person um, can be a bit more um, kind of specific to that ethnicity. Um, so we've done some work where we're looking for epitopes in HLAs that are really common in First Nations people, but might be rarer around the world. The COVID ones I've talked about today, they come from HLAs that are pretty common globally. Um, so we get a good kind of global representation, but there'd be certainly people we don't know about their epitopes for, not to say they don't exist. One more question from Peter. Um, thank you. So what's happening in the older people who, despite infection and vaccination, can still get severe disease? Have you yep. looked at those populations? Not in the case of COVID. Um, so it's quite like immunosenescence is known that comes with age. And so a colleague of mine um, has done a lot of work in the flu space and she's tracked kind of one particular epitope um, uh, kind of across the human lifespan. So she has 
um, kind of newborn samples, children, adults, and then elderly. Um, and then she's finding kind of changes in the repertoire, the T-cell repertoire associated with age that suggests that older people are ending up with an, uh, a repertoire that is not as good as the repertoire that you have at, at kind of middle age. And so there's this kind of attrition of your immune response and it, it's likely linked um, to your T-cell repertoire, so the real mechanics of how you're responding. Um, none of that is known yet for COVID, though. Louise, fabulous. You. You've got me worried about T-cell decline as, <laughs> as I get older. But, um, You'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you. It's um, time for... It's time for afternoon tea, and then we're back to the final two talks with the best yet to come. Thank you.